Hello everyone and welcome to the course of general surgery. Today we're going to talk about blood loss, hemorrhagic shock, replacement therapy and complications. All causes of blood loss can be divided for three groups. The first group is mechanical damage of the vascular wall, for example due to traumas. The second group is pathological condition of the vascular wall due to aneurysms, for example. The third group is disorders of the blood coagulation system, such as uh, thrombocytopenia and hemophilia. All about, about all of these causes we've been talking on our previous classes and our previous lectures. Examination of the patients. The patient will feel, for example, patient with a blood loss will be feeling some dizziness, weakness, um, lowering of the sensitivity. Um, also, the patients can lose uh, their cautiousness and they can have a pale skin and lowering of the skin temperature. And all of these signs are not specific. On the painting from the right, you can see a pale woman what is about to pass out. It's a common appearance of the anemic person of those times. Our patients will be looking something li like to the noble woman of the past, seem pale, weak in health and tend to lose their consciousness. So we're moving on and uh, let's talk about main key definitions for today's lecture. Um, shock. What is shock? is it's the life-threatening condition that occurs when the body is not getting enough of blood flow. The shock can be divided for hemorrhagic or non-hemorrhagic. Hemorrhagic it can be part of a hypovolemic shock and is the most common cause of shock after injury. Non-hemorrhagic shock it's, can be divided for cardiogenic shock, cardiac tamponade, tangent pneumothorax, neurologic shock, and septic shock. Hypovolemic shock is, refers to a medical or surgical condition in which rapid fluid loss results in multiple organ failure due to inadequate circulation volume and subsequent inadequate perfusion. Hypovolemia is a state of an abnormally decreased volume of uh, circulating fluid in the body. Hemorrhage is an acute loss of circulating blood volume. Also, it can vary considerably. Normal adult blood volume is approximately 7% of body weight. The physiologic effects of hemorrhage are divided into four classes based on clinical signs, which are useful for estimating the percentage of acute blood loss. Classes of hemorrhage the first class is ex um, exemplified by the condition of an individual who has donated one unit of blood. Class 2 is uncomplicated hemorrhage for which crystalloid fluid res resuscitation is required. Class 3 is com uh, complicated hemorrhage state in which uh, at least Crystalloid infusion is required and perhaps also blood replacement. Class 4 hemorrhage is considered a preterminal pre event. Unless aggressive measures are taken, the patient will die within minutes. Blood transfusion is required. Class 1 hemorrhage. Less than 15% of blood volume loss. A clinical symptoms are minimal. In uncomplicated situations, minimal tachycardia occurs. No measurable changes occur in blood pressure, pulse pressure, or respiratory rate. For otherwise healthy patients, this amount of blood loss doesn't require replacement because transcapillary refill and other compensatory mechanisms will restore blood volume within 24 hours, usually without the need of blood transfusion. Class 2 hemorrhage, 15-30% to 30 of blood volume loss. Clinical signs include tachycardia, tachypnea, and decreased pulse pressure.
The latter sign is related primarily to a rise in diastolic blood pressure due to an increase in circulating catecholamines, which produce an increase in peripheral vascular tone and resistance. Systolic pressure changes minimally in early hemorrhage shock. Therefore, it's important to evaluate pulse pressure raisers and systolic pressure. Other clinical findings associated with this amount of blood loss include subtle central nervous system changes, such as anxiety, fear, and hostility. Despite the significant blood loss and cardiovascular changes, urinary output is only mildly affected. The measured urine flow is usually 20 to 30 milliliters per hour in adult with class 2 hemorrhage. Accompanying fluid loss can uh, exaggerate uh, the clinical manifestation of class 2 hemorrhage. Some patients in this category may eventually require blood transfusion, but most are stabilized initially with crystalloid solutions. Class 3 hemorrhage 31 to 40 percent of blood volume loss. Patients with class 3 hemorrhage typically present with the classic signs of inadequate perfusion, included marked tachycardia and tachypnea, significant changes in mental status, and an immeasurable fall in systolic blood pressure. In an uncomplicated case, this is the least amount of blood loss that consistently causes a drop in systolic blood pressure. The priority of initial management is to stop the hemorrhage by emergency operation or embolization if necessary. Most patients in this category will require packet red blood cells and blood products to reverse the shock state. Class 4 hemorrhage greater than 40% of blood volume loss. The degree of exsanguination ex uh, with class 4 hemorrhage is immediately life-threatening. Symptoms include marked tachycardia, a significant decrease in systolic blood pressure and a very narrow pulse pressure or unmeasurable diastolic blood pressure. Bradycardia may develop preterminally. Urinary output is ne uh, negligible and mental status is markedly depressed. The skin is cold and pale. Patients with class 4 hemorrhage frequently require repeat transfusion and immediate, immediate surgical intervention. To evaluate uh, the blood loss, you need to know shock index. Indec shock index is calculated from a simple equation relating heart rate and systolic blood pressure. Normal shock index is 0.5 to 0.7. It's precursor for evaluation of bleeding. When shock index is 1, it means a transient state. If the shock index is 1.5, it's severe shock. Or you also can talk about uh, the hemorrhage classes. If it's a mild shock, with class 1 hemorrhage, the shock index will be 1.0 or 1.1. Moderate shock or class 2 of hemorrhage, uh, the shock index will be 1.5. If shock severe or class 3 of hemorrhage, the shock index will be 2. And uh, if the shock is extremely severe and it's a class 4 of hemorrhage, the shock index will be 2.5 and greater. On this image, you can see ATLS classification of hemorrhagic shock. ATLS or Advanced Trauma Life Support is the something like a guide for the access or to the patients with traumas. So each class having percentage of blood loss and some descriptions for each of the class. So if you will know the shock index, you can relate it to the class of the blood loss and you can think, assume how much of blood loss patient has.
and to remind you about the treatment of each class of hemorrhage, I will sum on with um, these few sentences. Class 1 of hemorrhage shock is a blood donor's no uh, special treatment needed. Class 2 of hemorrhagic shock is uncomplicated shock and crystalloid fluid re resuscitation is required. Class 3 of hemorrhagic shock is complicated shock and crystalloid infusion is required and perhaps also blood replacement. And class 4 of hemorrhagic shock is a preterminal event and blood is required. Blood loss pathophysiology. Early circulatory responses to blood loss are compensatory and include progressive vasoconstriction of cutaneous muscular and visceral circula uh, circulation to preserve blood flow to the kidney, heart and brain. The usual response to acute circulation volume depletion is an increase in heart rate in attempt to preserve cardiac output. Tachycardia is the earliest measurable circulatory sign of shock. The release of endogenous catecholamines increases peripheral vascular resistance, which, is, which in turn increases diastolic blood pressure and reduces pulse pressure. This increase in uh, pressure does little to increase organ perfusion and tissue oxygena oxygenation. The most effective method of restoring adequate cardiac output and organ perfusion and tissue, tissue exogenation is to restore venous return to normal by locating and stopping the source of bleeding. Volume repletion will allow recovery from the shock state only when the bleeding has stopped. At the cellular level, inadequate perfused and poorly oxygenated cells are deprived of essential substrates for normal aerobic metabolism and energy production. Compensation occurs by shifting to anaerobic metabolism, resulting in formation of lactic acid and development of metabolic acidosis. Stopping the bleeding and providing an adequate oxygenation, ventilation and appropriate fluid resuscitation Repeat intravenous excess must be obtained. Administration of an appropriate quantity of isotonic electrolyte solutions, blood and blood products help combat this process. Vas uh, vasopressors and are contraindicated as a first-line uh, treatment of hemorrhagic shock because they worse tissue perfusion. Recognition of shock. Relying solely on uh, systolic blood pressure as an indicator of shock can delay recognition of the, uh, of the condition. As compensatory mechanism can prevent a measurable fall in systolic pressure, pressure until up to 30% of the patient's blood volume is lost. So the systolic pl uh, blood pressure will not drop until the patient lost more than 30% of blood. Look closely, uh, look closely at pulse rate, pulse uh, character and respiratory rate, skin perfusion and pulse pressure. In most adults, uh, tachycardia and cutaneous vasoconstriction are the typical early physiologic responses to volume loss. Any injured patient who is cool uh, to the touch and is tachycardic should be considered uh, to be in shock until proven otherwise. Tachycardia is diagnosed when the heart rate is greater than 160 beats per minute in an infant, 140 in a preschool aged child, 120 in children from school aged to puberty, and 100 heartbeats per minute in adults. Elderly patients may not exhibit tachycardia because of their limited cardiac response to catecholamine stimulation or the concurrent use of medications, such as beta-adrenergic blocking agents. Massive blood loss may produce uh, 
only a slight decrease in initial hematocrit or hemoglobin concentration. Thus, a very low hematocrit value obtained shortly after injury suggests either massive blood loss or a pre-existing anemia. And a normal hematocrit does not exclude significant blood loss. Base deficit and or lactate levels can be useful in determining the presence and severity of shock. Clinical evaluation. A patient with injuries above the diaphragm may have evidences of inadequate organ perfusion and tissue oxygenation due to poor cardiac performance from blunt myocardial injury, cardiac tamponade, or a tangent pneumothorax that produces inadequate venous return. All patients must be evaluated through the ABCDE's assessment. Source of potential blood loss need to be checked, such as chest, abdomen, pelvis, retroperitoneum, extremities, and external bleeding. Chest and pelvic X-ray and FAST protocol need to be done. Diagnostic peritoneal leverage and blood cauterization are used to determine the source of blood loss. If uh, you see that patient have uh, bruising and hematomas in uh, in, in perineal, uh, it may indicate retral injuries and uh, contraindicates uh, the insertion of a uh, transuretral catheter before radiographic uh, confirmation of uh, an intact uretra. So, um, during catheterization of the, uh, of the bladder, you can see hematria and it can be a sign of the problem in those directions. Use uh, clinical information including heart rate, blood pressure, skin perfusion, and mental status. Um, also, you need to evaluate um, the blood gas measurements, if it's applicable, of course, and available at your hospital, oxygen saturation, and base deficit. Also, you need to see uh, serum lactate levels. On this X-ray, you can see the sample of right hemothorax as you see here like a level of the fluid over here and on this page, image you can see the normal anatomy of the heart and he, here's a large pericardial effusion on the following two slides you will see two different videos and on the first video you will see the fast protocol and on the second video, you will see ABCDE's evaluation of the patients. Welcome to this Radiology Nation ultrasound video tutorial. During the course of this video, we will describe a technique for performing a FAST scan. FAST stands for Focus Assessment with Sonography in Trauma. Depending on where you work, the exact role of ultrasound in the assessment of trauma Will vary. In this video, we will describe the basic principles. The primary aim of a FAST scan is to identify major lacerations or injuries to the abdominal viscera and to identify any free fluid, which is assumed to be blood in the acute trauma setting. We start this examination by briefly looking through the liver and the right kidney. We are also looking for free fluid. Free fluid will be seen in the hepatorenal recess or in the subphrenic space. We also store a representative image. We will now move on to the left upper quadrant. First, we will inspect the spleen for signs of laceration, and then the left kidney. In particular, we are also looking in the splenorenal recess and in the subphrenic space for free fluid. Another representative image is stored at this point. Now we move on to the pericardial space. We need to change our depth to optimize our image. This subcostal view allows us to identify a pericardial effusion. A pericardial effusion collects between the layers of pericardium. If the effusion is particularly large, this can compress upon the heart and cause cardiac tamponade. 
We now examine the pelvis, looking for signs of bladder rupture. Intraabdominal free fluid will often collect posterior to the bladder. In males, this space is known as the rectovesical pouch, as shown in this example. In females, this space is known as the rectouterine pouch, or pouch of Douglas. This concludes the fast scan. Here are the collection of still images we acquired during the course of this examination. Let's now look at some examples of pathology. Here we see footage from a normal right upper quadrant ultrasound. And we can contrast that with an ultrasound that shows a thin rim of free fluid collecting within the hepatorenal space. In this example, we are looking in the left upper quadrant. And a thin margin of fluid can be seen just inferior to the splenic tip. In this subcostal view, we see anechoic fluid surrounding the entire heart. This represents a pericardial effusion. In these two still ultrasound images, free fluid is seen collecting above the bladder in the male and above and behind the uterus in the female. The use of ultrasound in the trauma setting is limited to a brief assessment of the abdominal viscera and the identification of free fluid. Detailed assessment with ultrasound in the trauma setting is often not considered appropriate as it is perceived to delay definitive investigation in the form of a CT. Regardless of the role ultrasound plays at your particular institute, we hope this tutorial has been of some value to you. Thank you for watching this Radiology Nation video. If you liked it, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, and you can also follow us on our various social media accounts. Thank you for tuning in to the OSCE station. Today, we will be showing you how to do a quick and effective A to E assessment on a patient. This can be used in the initial management of an acutely unwell patient or for a general patient review. Starting with A, we first assess the airway and its patency. If the patient is talking, then the airway is patent. Listen out for any added sounds, such as inspiratory stridor or an expiratory wheeze. We also want to look for signs of airway obstruction. This could include a paradoxical chest and abdominal movements, otherwise known as seesaw respirations, and any use of accessory muscles. Consider an airway manoeuvre such as head tilt, chin lift or a jaw thrust. You may want to escalate to a senior and insert an airway adjunct such as a nasopharyngeal tube, or if the GCS is less than 8, using a Goodell airway. Moving on to B, this stands for breathing. At this stage, you want to rule out any immediately life-threatening conditions, such as acute severe asthma, pulmonary edema, tension pneumothorax, and massive hemothorax. At this stage, you should assess the patient's respiratory rate and perform a focused respiratory exam, looking in particular for respiratory distress, noting any chest deformity, the trachea position, a hyper-resonant percussion note, and decreased breath sounds. It's important to mention the oxygen sats, these should ideally be maintained between 94 and 98%, unless the patient has a background of COPD where they should be maintained at 88 to 92, as high oxygen concentrations could depress breathing. If the patient has a new oxygen requirement, this really needs to be investigated, and you might think about requesting a chest x-ray. You could also think about doing an ABG and treating any reversible and life-threatening causes with appropriate treatment. This could be adrenaline for anaphylaxis, salbutamide for pulmonary edema. You should consider a stepwise escalation in oxygen therapy with bag, mask, valves or NIV. C stands for circulation. Here you want to assess the patient's circulatory state. Look at the colour and temperature of their hands. Look at the capillary refill time. This should be less than two seconds. It gives us an indicator of how peripherally shut down the patient is. Assess the pulse rate and volume and regularity. Assess the blood pressure and listen to the heart. Ensure one or more large intravenous cannula are inserted and take relevant blood. Assume hypovolemia is the primary cause of shock until proven otherwise and a fluid challenge would be appropriate treatment at this stage. It's important to reassess the response to this. D stands for disability. Here, check the patient's glucose levels and ensure the pupils are equal and reactive. You can make a rapid initial assessment of the patient's conscious level using the AFPU method. A for alert, 
V for vocal stimuli, P for painful stimuli, or U, unresponsive to all stimuli. At this stage, you should also check the patient's drug chart for reversible drug-induced causes of low GCS. E stands for exposure and everything else which might be relevant to your patient's case. Examine the rest of the body for skin changes and bleeding sites. In summary, remember to assess and then treat any abnormal findings before you move on to the next step. Keep reassessing through the A to E to see if your management's helping, and if not, escalate to a senior, or if you need help at any point. Remember to always document your findings clearly in the patient notes and consider ceilings of care. Thanks for watching. The initial fluid therapy. Administer an initial one fluid bolus of isotonic fluid. The usual dose is one liter for adults and 20 milliliters per kilogram for pediatric patients weighing less than 40 kilograms. Assess the patient's response to fluid resuscitation and identify evidence of adequate end organ perfusion and tissue oxygenation. The goal of resuscitation is to restore organ perfusion and tissue oxygenation, which is accomplished with administering crystalloid solutions and blood products to replace lost intravascular volume. Early resuscitation with blood and blood products must be considered in patients with evidence evidence of class 3 and 4 hemorrhage. Early administration of blood products at a low ratio of packed red blood cells to plasma and platelets can prevent the development of cardiomyopathy and thrombocytopenia. Signs of patient's response to the therapy. Return of normal blood pressure, pulse pressure and pulse rate. Signs that perfusion is returning to normal. Improvement of volume of urinary output. It's a reasonably sensitive indicator for renal perfusion. Normal urine volume generally imply adequate renal blood flow. If not modified by underlying kidney injury, market hyperlykemia or the administration of uh, diuretic agents. For this reason, urinary output is one of the prime indicators of res uh, resuscitation and patient's respond. And patient's response. Adequate volume of replacement during resuscitation should produce a urinary output of approximately 0.5 ml per kilogram per hour in adults, whereas 1 ml per kilogram per hour is adequate urinary output for pediatric patients. For children under one year old of age, 2 ml per kilogram per hour should be maintained. Base deficit and or lactate values can be useful in determining, uh, determining the presence and severity of shock and then serial measurement of these parameters can be used to monitor the res response to the therapy. Also need to consider initi uh, initiating a massive transfusion protocol if the patient having a transient response or having continuing bleeding. Fail uh, failure to respond uh, to crystalloid and blood administration in the emergency department dictates the need of, for immediate definitive intervention, such as operating, operation or angioembolization uh, to, co uh, to control exsanguination um, of the patients. And a massive uh, transfusion protocol must be initiated in this case. Blood re replacement. We use in fluids such as crystalloids and colloids and blood products such as whole blood, packed red blood cells, platelets, fresh frozen plasma, cryoprecipitate, precipitate and recombinant factor 7a which used mostly for hemophilia. Blood transfusion. 
replacement of the blood via intravenous infusion of the donated blood product. The main purpose of blood transfusion is to restore the oxygen-carrying capacity of the intravascular volume. On the following slide, you will see the video about blood types. A blood type refers to the presence or absence of a certain marker or antigen on the surface of a person's red blood cells. For example, in the ABO system, presence of A or B antigen gives type A or B, presence of both antigens gives type AB, while their absence gives type O. Blood typing is critical for blood transfusion, as there are very specific ways in which blood types must be matched between a donor and recipient for a safe transfusion. The rule is simple. Patients should not be given antigens that their own blood does not have. This is because the recipient's immune system may recognize any new antigen as foreign and develop antibodies to target it for destruction. Depending on the scale of the triggered immune response, the reaction can be serious or fatal. Applying the rule, a type A patient who is negative for B antigen can only receive blood from type A and type O donors whose blood does not contain B antigen. A type AB patient having both antigens can receive blood from anyone, while a type O person being negative for both A and B can only receive from type O donors but can give blood to anyone. Another important system is the RH system for which D antigen, or Rh factor, is best known. The blood type for this antigen can be either Rh positive or Rh negative. By the same rule, a Rh negative patient cannot receive blood from a Rh positive donor, while the reverse direction is fine. Each of the four types of the ABO system can be Rh positive or negative. This gives eight possible combinations, the eight basic blood types everyone knows about. But ABO and RH are only a fraction of the 35 currently known blood group systems, many of which can cause serious reactions during transfusion if mismatched. Altogether, there are hundreds of antigens, giving rise to a gigantic number of possible blood types. A fully specified blood type should describe the complete set of antigens that a person has. In theory, this list must be determined for both donor and recipient before a transfusion can take place. In reality, however, most people only need to care about their ABO type and RH factor. The ABO and RH systems are the most important in blood transfusion for two reasons. First, most people can produce robust antibodies against A, B, and D antigens, which may not be the case for other antigens. In fact, anti-A and anti-B antibodies are usually developed during the first year of life. Second, the eight basic blood types are distributed in comparable proportions that makes mismatching a likely event. Most other antigens occur at such frequencies that only a very small subset of patients is potentially at risk. For example, if 99.99% .99 of a population is positive for a certain antigen and only 0.01% is negative, only that tiny fraction of negative patients is at risk regarding that antigen. To account for possible incompatibility outside ABO and RH, an additional test is usually made before a transfusion. A blood sample from the patient is mixed with a sample of donor blood and the mixture is examined for clumps. No clumping means a compatible match. Before performing the transfusion, you need to perform some simple steps such as requesting testing, verification of the patient's identification, collecting and labeling the patient's in samples, ABO and RH typing, antibody screening and compatibility testing. And only after all of the steps you can select uh, compatible units for transfusion. During blood product transfusion, the patient uh, may have a typical response or abnormal response. The typical response will be no reactions, but abnormal response will have some symptoms from the side of the patient, such as itching, fever, chills, hypotension, dyspnea, 
On the following uh, on the following slide, you will watch the video about complications what might be after the blood transfusion. For, for the people early on in their medical career who have never stepped foot in a hospital before, let me take one step back and just explain what a blood transfusion is. So when somebody comes into the hospital and they have a hemoglobin level that's less than 7.0, you need to give them blood because we've got a lot of research that shows outcomes are better when people have a hemoglobin that's 7.0 or higher. They're less likely to experience things like strokes, myocardial infarctions, etc. So you give them blood in a transfusion. You literally hang blood on the IV pole, you put an IV in their arm, and you let that blood slowly go into their body to replete their hemoglobin that they've otherwise lost through some, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. That's a blood transfusion. So blood transfusion reactions are what happen when the host or the, the patient receiving the blood has some type of adverse reaction to the blood that they're getting. And that's what this video is on today. So when you think about somebody who's getting a blood transfusion, what do you think of? Who gives it to the patient? Well, the nurse does, but not just any nurse, a fat nurse. And a fat nurse is gonna be our mnemonic for remembering the different types of blood transfusion reactions. So. In your head, when you're thinking about the mnemonic, who gives blood transfusions in the hospital? Nurses do. But specifically, what kind of nurse in today's video? A fat nurse. With that in mind, this is the chart that we're going to use to outline the four different types of blood transfusion reactions. Now, the mnemonic, which I'm going to put on the slide, but I just want to show you first, is a fat nurse hemolyzed my labs. A, fat nurse hemolyzed my labs. Now, Let's put that across the bottom and I'll explain these as we go. So the first type of transfusion reaction is the allergic, sometimes called anaphylactic transfusion reaction. And the way that you remember that is using our mnemonic that a fat nurse hemolyzed my labs. So the A in A, fat nurse, is our first blood transfusion reaction. So A for allergic or A for anaphylactic. Now this is a type one hypersensitivity reaction that occurs due to plasma proteins in the blood that the patient is receiving. Specifically, they're gonna experience symptoms like any allergic reaction or any anaphylactic reaction. So things like itching or pruritus, urticaria, and if it's really profound, septic shock, okay? So these are all of the symptoms that you would classically find in any allergic reaction. So think about somebody who's allergic to peanuts and eats a nut, right? Itching, wheels, septic shock, if it's really, really severe. The timing is going to occur in about two to three hours. So two to three hours for our allergic or anaphylactic blood transfusion reaction. Now, something that's very, very high yield that ties in beautifully with this mnemonic is that patients with IgA deficiencies are at huge risk of allergic transfusion reactions, enormous risk. And we can remember that easily because IgA has A in it, and A for allergic, anaphylactic, and A, fat nurse, hemolyzed my lab. So it goes beautifully with the mnemonic. So just to summarize, the first type of blood transfusion reaction is the allergic transfusion reaction, where the patient has sort of like a, an allergic reaction to the blood that they're receiving. This is due to plasma proteins in the blood. You're especially at risk for this if you have an IgA deficiency. The symptoms are all the symptoms that you classically see in an allergic reaction, so pruritus or urticaria, respiratory depression and shock if severe, and this occurs on the order of two to three hours. That is our first type of blood transfusion reaction, which you can remember by saying to yourself, a fat nurse hemolyzed my labs, and A for allergic and A for IgA deficiency. Our second type of transfusion reaction is the febrile non-hemolytic type. Okay, febrile non-hemolytic blood transfusion reaction. And the way that you remember this is with the second part of our mnemonic here, the second part of our sentence, fat nurse. Fat nurse, F in fat for febrile and N in nurse for non-hemolytic. Now this is a type two hypersensitivity and this occurs when the host antibodies react against the donor's white blood cells. Okay, so there's white cells that are gonna be in the blood that the donor or the donor blood has and the host will form antibodies against those white cells, have a type two hypersensitivity reaction, and that is the basis for this transfusion reaction. Now specifically, there are cytokines in the blood. 
right? Every, every blood, everybody who has blood has cytokines in it. And what happens here is that when that blood is stored in the blood bank in the hospital, waiting to be used to give a patient blood, those cytokines are actually uh, accumulating and they cause this sort of massive uh, response in a in the form of a febrile non-hemolytic reaction. So the symptoms are going to be fever, headache, and flushing. And I want you to pay very special attention to the name of this reaction. So it's called febrile non-hemolytic. So febrile tells you that you're going to see fever. Okay. So if you see fever in the vignette, it's probably febrile non-hemolytic. But even more so, it's non-hemolytic, right? There is no hemolysis. So you're not going to see symptoms of hemolysis, which is important because that differentiates this from the next type of blood transfusion reaction that we're going to talk about where you do see hemolysis. So just the name febrile non-hemolytic tells you fever and no hemolysis. So again, fat nurse, febrile non-hemolytic, non-hemolytic should cue you off, should tell you that there's no hemolysis. So you're not going to see any symptoms of hemolysis. So if you're taking your test and the vignette is giving you symptoms of hemolysis, then it's clearly not a febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reaction because this one doesn't have hemolysis, hence the name. So, so far we've said A, fat nurse, A for allergic, and fat nurse for febrile non-hemolytic. So far, so good, right guys? Not too complicated. If you keep it simple in the context of the mnemonic, you'll, you'll remember this quite easily. Now, I'm going to take this one step further for you. So, in this febrile non-hemolytic blood transfusion reaction, the problem is coming because of those uh, cyto cytokines that are accumulating. And I want you to think of a nurse who accumulates medications in their little nursing cart in the hospital. So when I think about the fat nurse, and of course on this slide, she's not fat, but she's a nurse nonetheless, I think about accumulating medications in their little cart that they wheel around from, from room to room. So the nurse accumulates medications in their cart, just like the cytokines accumulate uh, during the storage of the blood products. And that goes with the febrile non-hemolytic reaction, because that's the one in our mnemonic that corresponds to a fat nurse. So I always bring it back within the mnemonic to help me remember what I'm talking about with different types of transfusion reactions. Okay, so here's where we are so far. We're going to move on to our third type of transfusion reaction. Guys, look at this. You already know half of the transfusion reactions, and we've spent, what, four minutes in this video so far? Next one is the hemolytic transfusion reaction, sometimes called the acute hemolytic blood transfusion reaction. So really all you need to know is that it's the hemolytic one, right? Because when you look at the answer choices, you're going to see allergic, you're going to see febrile non-hemolytic, you're going to see hemolytic, and then you'll see the fourth one, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But all you need to know is that it's hemolytic. So don't worry about all the other words in the name. It's the one that has hemolytic in it. Now, this one obviously corresponds to the H in our mnemonic. So a fat nurse hemolyzed my lab. So when blood hemolyzes, uh, it can't be read in the lab of the hospital. So that's what hemolyzed blood is. And that's why the mnemonic makes sense. But in this one, it's a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction with both intra and or extravascular hemolysis. So again, this one is called hemolytic. So this is the one where you're going to see signs and symptoms of hemolysis. No surprise if you look at the name. This is due to host antibodies against the donor's red blood cells. So the host antibodies react against the, do the donor's red blood cells in the blood and then will cause intra or extravascular hemolysis and lyse those red blood cells, causing signs and symptoms of hemolysis. And again, just to beat the dead horse, it's called hemolytic. It's the hemolytic blood transfusion reaction. So you see hemolysis. Therefore, let's look at our symptoms. Flank pain, hemoglobinuria, and jaundice. So flank pain is due to hemolysis occurring in the kidneys. When hemolysis occurs in the kidneys, you get a microangiopathic injury to the kidneys. You're going to get symptoms of flank pain. Hemoglobinuria. Well, you're lysing red blood cells and you're spilling hemoglobin out, which is going to be excreted into the urine. So you're going to see dark urine, right? That's intravascular hemolysis. And jaundice is obviously a sign of extravascular hemolysis. You should know that if you've been studying at all. So if you see jaundice, dark urine, aka hemoglobinuria, or flank pain due to hemolysis occurring in the vasculature around the kidney. These are all signs and symptoms of hemolysis, so you know that this is the hemolytic blood transfusion reaction. A fat nurse, hemolyzed, H and hemolyzed, H and hemolytic, my labs. And this occurs in one hour. Uh, let's talk about our last blood transfusion reaction. So that's the lung injury 
I call it the lung injury transfusion reaction. You might see it as acute injury to the lung due to uh, blood transfusion. Whatever it is, it's the one that has lung in the name, okay? So a fat nurse hemolyzed my labs. L in labs, L in lung. So this is when donor anti-leukocyte antibodies uh, attack the recipient endothelial cells of the lung. So in the donor's blood, there are antibodies. And once the blood is given to the patient, those antibodies, which are still formed, go specifically into the lung and attack the endothelial cells of the lung. So they destroy the host's lung or they destroy the patient receiving the blood's lung, okay? Now, because of this, it's injuring the lung. So what symptoms will we see? We'll see things that injure the lung, no surprise. Things like respiratory collapse and pulmonary edema. So anytime that you're injuring cells in the body, it doesn't matter where it is, you're going to see signs of inflammation. So edema, rubor, pain, aka dolor, right? We're talking Latin now. So you see edema in the lungs, pulmonary edema, no surprise, because we're seeing damage to lung tissue. Uh, respiratory collapse because there's too much inflammation going on, and that's going to back up and cause right-sided heart failure. Now, this will occur... Uh, on the order of one to six hours. Now, let's pause for a second. How important is it for you to know the timing of these different reactions? It's really not that important, but if you're going to shove it into your brain, I put it on this slide just for completeness sake. But again, lung injury transfusion reaction, donor anti-leukocyte antibodies against the host or the recipient's endothelial cells of the lungs, causing pulmonary edema, respiratory compromise, possibly right-sided heart failure if it's really severe, and it will occur in one to six hours. But guys, that's it. This is the summary slide. You now know all of the transfusion reactions because when you think about blood transfusions, you say to yourself, who gives the blood? And the answer is a fat nurse. And then the mnemonic, of course, is a fat nurse hemolyzed my labs. If you know that, you know these transfusion reactions, you'll get every question right on test day. Remember to keep it simple, keep it stupid, and you will do well. Massive transfusion refers to the transfusion of more than 10 units of re packed red blood cells or entire blood volume over a 24-hour period. This can lead to problems such as uh, hypothermia, coholopathies, and acid-based disturbances. Patients with severe hemorrhage may develop a refractory hemorrhage due to a collection of factors such as uh, dilution of clotting factors, hypothermia from uh, transfusion of cold products, hypocalcemia-induced coholopathy, and acidosis. On this picture, you can see a general scan for the massive transfusion protocol. And on the following slide, you will be watching video about massive transfusion protocol. Okay, this is the quick and dirty about massive transfusion protocol, which is the trauma protocol number 8.0. Definition of MTP is replacement of blood components equaling one blood volume in the first 24 hours, which for adults would be about five units of blood. For pediatrics, it's 70 milliliters per kilogram. You want to initiate MTP or massive transfusion protocol with two or more positive findings, either a penetrating injury, a positive fast, an age-adjusted shock index for tachycardia and hypotension, which in the ED we don't really do, uh, but I'll explain it on the next slide, an elevated serum lactate of greater than 3.5 or a base deficit of exceeding negative 8.8. This is a shock index, which is a predictor of morbidity and mortality. Uh, what you would do is put the age in, you put their maximum heart rate and their minimum systolic blood pressure, and this predicts how well the patient is going to do. Um, so for this patient, uh, he is six, his maximum heart rate is 136, minimum systolic uh, blood pressure was 85, he's 1.6, normal is 1.2, so he has an elevated risk of mor morbidity mortality. The goal for massive transfusion protocol is to replace blood loss and trauma, to treat hematologic and oncologic conditions, and we want to maintain a hemoglobin of 7 grams per deciliter and a hematocrit of about 25%. What comes next? So the physician is the one that will order the uh, MTP, but uh, I would encourage nurses as they're seeing that things happening in the room 
to encourage the physician to order the MTP because we wanted to order it early so that things can be in process in the blood bank. For the PICU, it's going to be an apex order. In the ED, it's a verbal order on the critical care flow sheet in, um, in, the, in trauma. The nurse is going to notify the blood bank that it's been activated, and they will ask for the patient's vital information, including their age, their weight, their MRN, and CSN. You're going to send off some labs, a CBC, coags, type and cross match, and of course, the tag. You're going to collect a, an ISTAT or EPOC. Send a courier to pick up all the blood products. In the ED, we have a blood refrigerator in the med room that has your first packet, which is two pack cells and one unit of uh, fresh frozen or never frozen plasma. In full traumas, the blood bank will come down with uh, two units of pack cells and one unit of never frozen plasma as well. So these are the packages and it's based on weight. So for a child of that's less than 15 kilograms, the first packet, they're gonna send one unit of pack cells, one unit of plasma, and one unit of platelets. This is not to say that this patient's gonna get one unit of pack cells. It's gonna be based on weight. For pack cells, it's generally 10 milligrams per, or yeah, 10 milliliters per kilogram. So for a 15 kilogram uh, patient, that would be about 150 milliliters of pack cells. So that's, you know, normally a um, unit of pack cells is about 250-ish, 300. So we'd have some blood left over. So once you start, once we start on the first packet, the blood bank is preparing the second one. If you use the second one, they're preparing the third, which is very important, especially now uh, that there's a shortage of blood that you let the, the blood bank know when the MTP is no longer required for your patient. So what's in the cooler? Like I said, it's two units of O-negative pack cells, one unit of never frozen plasma. And if platelets are needed, they need to come from the blood bank. The blood is used, it, it must be used or returned to the ED within four hours of taking it from the blood bank. So you have four hours, this includes your tubing, your blood tubing, anything that uh, the blood is going through, it's only good for four hours. So what's the order of administration? For the ED, it's provider dependent. Most often it starts with pack cells, uh, but it really depends on what the physician feels is going on. Um, in the PICU, it's also provider dependent and also based on the thromboelast thromboelastogram, which is the TEG, which is sent in the ED for traumas. There's a separate lecture on TEG, so I'm not gonna go through this. This is just the graph for uh, the TEG. Concerning conditions with massive transfusion, transfusion associated coagulopathies. So uh, you're giving pack cells, you're diluting your clotting factors, which could cause more bleeding. So you wanna give TXA. Hypocalcemia, it binds to citrate, which is a preservative that's in our pack cells, in our blood products. Um, so after multiple units or multiple aliquots of pack cells, we want to remind the physicians that they need some calcium, which is usually in the form of calcium chloride. You want to avoid hypothermia. So you want to uh, give your blood products through a fluid warmer or, and also have external warming measures. It can also cause hypo or hyperkalemia. So you want to keep an eye on those uh, electrolytes. So in summary, you want to activate MTP early. You wanna keep your patient warm, make sure you don't uh, activate that triad of death, uh, watch your electrolytes, and don't forget to notify the lab when MTP is no longer needed. That's all for today. Thank you for watching and see you on my following lectures.